Thanks, Anita. Uh, my name is Wallace Prince, and uh, I have a background in semiconductors where I managed a group of PhD computational research scientists, and that was a lot of fun, but I wanted to get a bigger background in data science, so I came here. Uh, my topic is on Android malware using big data tools, and what I wanted to focus on was really, if you want to study malware, you need to go where malware is. So uh, approximately 85% of worldwide mobile utilization is using the Android operating system, but actually 99% of mobile malware attacks occur on Android. So uh, luckily, um, I was able to uh, look into uh, the Android operating system pretty deeply. So what do you do with that? So you say, is your phone hacked? How would you know that? You could run antivirus software, which looks at the binary applications on your phone and tries to fingerprint them against known malware. But what if you give access to an app and ask you for permissions and you say, yes, go ahead, have permissions to my SMS uh, records or my contact list. How do you trust that app? What do you think is going on? What if this guy's the one that wrote that app? <laughs> and you must robot fans. <laughs> okay, so uh, I was able to get access to this database uh, at a Ben Gurion University called uh, Sherlock, and it actually has two parts to it. It's the Moriarty and the Sherlock applications. And so the way this works is uh, Moriarty is a malicious application that runs in on your phone, and like it would do something like look like perhaps um, a web browser, but maybe one percent of the time, five percent of the time, it's going to do something like uh, steal all your photos and upload them to a server in Israel in this case, but possibly could be Russia if it was an actually real malicious app. On the other side of it uh, is Sherlock. And Sherlock tracks everything that's going on on your phone, everything from CPU utilization, all the incoming and outgoing phone records, SMS records, how much memory, how much space is left in your storage. All that's happening in Sherlock and it's almost running continuously in real time while well, Moriarty leaves clues behind what is actually a benign activity or a malicious activity. So I thought I was going to be able to just start querying uh, Ben Gurion University's Hive database, but it turned out that was not the case. So what happened is actually they gave me access to the data as uh, a link to a Google Drive, which has approximately um, six terabytes worth of raw phone log data into it. So I'm thinking to myself, this is not gonna fit on my MacBook. <laughs> uh, so what do we do? So, okay, so you get this into Amazon Web Services and especially uh, using their Elastic MapReduce program and uh, Spark, which allows you to do very big data analytics really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about this slide too much, but I think the main point that I'm trying to get across is that all my data was stored in the Amazon S3, which allows you to have quite a bit of uh, essentially unlimited storage, and it works very closely with the uh, Spark database that you can spin up in the Elastic MapReduce. So the main two uh, parts of my project that I really spent a lot of time is data munging, which is actually going through all of those records, um, cleaning it up, looking for uh, useful metrics, and then also, uh, of course, modeling. And all that can be done inside of Spark. So I use the Spark machine learning libraries that are built in. Uh, just to get an idea, so I, I start with uh, some raw logs here that's just shown in white. And then I have to basically determine whether these are malicious or not, uh, which is colored. And then once you do that, you have to essentially vectorize it, which means each row becomes a specific event. So I have a time slice that I take to a row. And then I actually have to look at the important features. Um, and one other example, just that Spark is really nice, is it gives you these kind of visualizations, which is um, considered a directed acyclic graph, is what they call this. And essentially what this is, is along the top here, each one of those columns is essentially a filter and aggregation subquery that I would be doing if it was just a normal SQL database. And along the right are all the different joins on all those features. And then what I'm actually training my machine learning model on, it's just this one little square down here at the bottom. So Spark is really nice because it automates all these things. Um, so, at the end of the day, I trained two different uh, classification models. I did a logistic regression, which is kind of the baseline standard um, classifier that you do in almost any machine learning, as well as a gradient boosted trees, which is really considered more of an advanced model and has a lot more ability to discern subtle uh, distinctions. So, what's really important here is I'm looking at my accuracy in the gradient boosted trees case, it's about 96%. But when you're looking at malware, what you really care about is actually false uh, 
false negatives where you say it's not malware, but it turns out it actually was. So in that case, you can calculate that through the sensitivity metric. And I was able to get about 97% sensitivity, um, and all that was done on a cluster in Amazon land. So with that, uh, thank you. I'll ask, uh, answer any questions, and appreciate any feedback. You have. Thank you. parts of the data set were the most meaningful? Which features? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. I actually have a picture here. So uh, maybe that's impossible to read. But um, one of the things that uh, was really nice about this data set, and the question was, if you couldn't hear it, um, what parts of the data were most meaningful? Uh, a lot of the data that they collect actually turned out to be not useful in my case. I was studying ransomware, uh, which is a specific kind of malware where they encrypt your phone or they encrypt the data portions of your phone and then demand money to unencrypt it. But a lot of this uh, was taking things like which cell tower you collected, uh, connected to, how many Wi-Fi hotspots are around you, do you have a Bluetooth device, is your Bluetooth device charged? All these things could be useful in other contexts, but for ransomware it wasn't. So in my case, what I really cared about was what they consider the T4, which is really the heart of your uh, device. So how utilized is your CPU, like how fast is the battery draining, uh, how much storage do you have on hand? So all those things are predictive. When your CPU utilization is really high and your storage space is dropping really quickly, something's going on. Either you're downloading a big file or all of a sudden now you're encrypting everything on your device and it's hard to tell between those two, but this actually was able to do that. Any other questions? Yes? How were they able to apply labels to the data? So yeah, so that's good. So Moriarty, which uh, I talked about up here, is actually an application that they got the, oh, so, by the way, I mentioned, uh, these are volunteers that are running this software on their devices. And so what they do is the Moriarty is custom written malware that takes known malware, um, essentially like binaries, and they repackage it to be non-destructive. So what it's doing is it's doing exactly the same things as what the malware does, but it's not actually uploading it to China, it's uploading it to the Israeli University where it's anonymized and, and secure. So it labels it during the process. So it's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a vaccine almost. It's like the, the, the dangerous part's been pulled out, but they're able to, to generate right. information. Right, so it, it's, like, it's like having a vaccine, uh, except that you actually do get sick, and uh, all of a sudden the blue dots on your forehead spell uh, you know, Zika or something like that. So you're like, oh, I know what's going on. And uh, by the way, I really do feel sick.